Boy, it has been a while since I've hung out with my good friend Randy Helmel. Uh, lots of computer things going on in both our worlds, but we've got to figure it out today, and we're ready to play. You but got it's, her, Dave. It's it's good to hear your voice again, Randy, and see your lovely mug. <laughs> <laughs> It's, oh, been a, it's been a while for us, hasn't it, buddy? How's life been? Yeah, good for you? Very good. Very good, Dave. Uh, things are groovy. <laughs> you must be getting ready for a few weddings. I mean, summer's on the way. Class CFM must be busy. Yeah, actually, um, my wedding started uh, May 2-4 weekend, and I've got between now and Thanksgiving weekend, well, I've done four weddings already. I've got six more weddings uh, to uh, to do right up until Thanksgiving weekend. Wow, uh, classy FM, always, always hard work. Um, you still enjoy it, right? You still enjoy getting out? And oh, doing... abs absolutely, Dave. I still have the passion, the fire uh, to DJ, uh, to serve my clients to the very best of my ability. We should uh, give out that email one more time, too. What's your email if they want to get a hold of you for a DJ job? Yeah, uh, my email is, you can go to www rh at classy fm that's classy with a k classy fm dj dot com perfect my friend perfect my friend and the reason i wanted to sit down today and talk with you was we lost another icon in the music industry in the last little bit and i was hoping you could give me some insight into her career tina turner the queen of rock and roll man it's it's sad it's we're losing too many. It seems like you and I are doing a lot of tribute shows lately, but let's talk about all the positives that she did in her life. Absolutely, Dave. Well, let's start with her early life. Tina Turner, she was born Anna Mae Bullock, no relation to Sandra, <laughs> the movie star. She was born November 26th, 1939, and she was an American-born Swiss singer. Uh, known as the queen of rock and roll, Tina, she rose to prominence as the lead singer of the Ike and Tina Turner Review. Now, this was before launching a very successful career as a solo performer. Now, she was noted for her swagger, her sensuality, powerful gravelly vocals, and really unstoppable energy. Turner began her career with Ike Turner's band, Kings of Rhythm, the year 1957. Under the name of Little Anne, she appeared on her first record called Box Top in 1958. And speaking of Box Top, uh, the rock group, the Box Tops, they were very very prominent in the late 60s, early 70s. So anyway, she, de she uh, debuted as Tina Turner with the hit duet single, A Fool in Love. Now, the dual Ike and Tina Turner became one of the most formidable live acts in the history of rock and roll. They released such hits as it's going to work out fine. River Deep, Mountain High. And of course, one of their biggest, Proud Mary. And she comes from the uh, Nutbush city limits. And uh, Nutbush is in Tennessee. So in the 1980s, Tina Turner launched one of the greatest comebacks in music history. Her 1984 multi-platinum album entitled Private Dancer won the Grammy Award for the Record of the Year and became her first and only number one song on the Billboard Top 100. Boy, that's interesting. You know, with all the hits she's had, I, know. I would have thought she would have had a, a lot of number one hits on the Billboard Top 100. At the age of 44, she was the oldest female solo artist to top the Hot 100. Her success, her chart success continued with Better to Be Good to Me, Private Dancer, 
We Don't Need Another Hero. Yeah, I remember that one, the good song there. I Don't Want to Fight, Golden Eye, just to mention a few. Now, Tina also acted in the films Tommy from 1975 and Mad Max Beyond Thunderdrome, 1985. In 1986, she published her autobiography called Tina, My Life Story, which was adapted for the 1993 film, What's Love Got to Do With It? Now, there is a great song, again, by Tina Turner. So here we go. We're going to just, that was briefly a highlight of some of the, the most recent um, um, successes that Tina Turner had. In her early life, as I mentioned, she was born November 26, 1939, uh, in Brownsville, Tennessee. She was the youngest daughter of Floyd Bullock and his wife, Zelma Priscilla. The family lived in nearby rural, unincorporated community of Nutbush, Tennessee. Now, Nutbush, Tennessee, that would have population of between six and seven thousand people. So, uh, fairly small town. And her dad, he worked as an overseer of the sharecroppers at Poindexter Farm on Highway 180. Tina later recalled picking cotton with her family at a very early age. So the whole family together picking cotton, life was hard, money was very scarce. When she participated in the PBS series, African American Lives 2 with Henry Louis Gates Jr., he shared her, uh, he shared her genealogical DNA test estimates and traced her family timeline. Now, how good is this? And this is what's happening a lot today, Dave, as you know, in today's world, a lot of people are tracing their ancestry and that uh, through DNA. So anyway, they had, uh, Tina had two older sisters, Evelyn and Ruby. Ruby became a songwriter. She was the first cousin once removed by a bluesman, Eugene Bridges. Now, as young children, the three sisters were separated when their parents relocated to Knoxville, Tennessee, there to work at a defense facility during World War II. Bullock went to stay with her strict religious paternal grandparents, Alex and Roxana Bullock, who were deacon and deaconess at the Woodlawn Missionary Baptist Church. After the war, the sisters reunited with their parents and moved with them, excuse me, moved with them to Knoxville, Tennessee. Two years later, the family returned to Nutbush to live in the Flag Grove community where Bullock attended the Flag Grove Elementary School from first grade through to the eighth grade. So as you can see, early family beginnings, uh, life was tough, uh, money was hard, and the cotton picking for the whole family came together and they survived the tough years. Well, yeah, that's a day ever. Wow, what oh, a background, what a background. Absolutely. Now, let's take a look at the origins of Ike and Tina Turner, 1957 to 1960. She first met Ike Turner, performed with his band, The Kings of Rhythm, at the Manhattan Club, and this was in East St. Louis. Wow. She was so impressed by Ike's talent, recalling that she almost went into a trance watching him play. She asked Ike Turner to let her sing in his band, despite the fact that few women had ever sung with him. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Turner said he'd call her, but never did. So one night in 1957, she got hold of one of the microphones from the Kings of Rhythm drummer, Eugene Washington, and this was during the intermission. 
and she sang the B.B. King song, You Know I Love You. Upon hearing her sing, Ike Turner asked her if she knew more songs. Well, she sang the rest of the night and became a featured vocalist with his band. Thus, Ike and Tina Turner were born. How good is that? Just that drive to actually get up on stage, eh? She knew what she wanted to do. That's pretty cool. Oh, absolutely, Dave. Fantastic. And also for Ike to recognize her as a supreme talent this early, you know, 1957, 1960s. Hey, good for him. Good for him. Now we're going to take a look at uh, Tina's early success. The year is covering 1960 to 1965, and um, quite a quite a good uh, number of years of success. Tina was introduced to the public as Tina Turner with the single "A Fool in Love." The year was 1960. It reached number two on the Hot R&B Sides chart and number 27 on the Billboard Top 100. Another single, It's Gonna Work Out Fine, reached number 14 on the Hot 100 and number two on the R&B charts in 1961. Therefore, earning them a Grammy nomination for the best rock and roll performance. Oh, that's all right, that works well. Yeah. Other singles by Ike and Tina Turner, released between 1960 and 1962, include uh, I Idolize You, Poor Fool, and Tra La 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 La. Wow, that's got a nice ring to it. <laughs> hey, Randy, quick question for you. Yeah, yeah. Were you aware of her in 1960? Were you, were you hearing that music, or was she still sort of just being discovered? I know, like you said, she was up for a Grammy. They were up for a Grammy, but was that mm -hmm. relevant in... In Simcoe at the time in, in southern Ontario? Um, it it wasn't, it wasn't. They were just kind of at the edge, at the tip of the iceberg. Okay. And it wasn't really until they recorded Proud Mary that things yeah. just went full steam ahead. That's what I was wondering because you you know they had the hits, but I don't you don't know how much they were being heard, right? All over North America. Exactly right. Exactly right, Dave. And uh, between the years of 1963 and 1965, uh, the band toured constantly and they produced moderate success. Uh, here again, Tina's first credited single as a solo artist, Too Many Ties That Bind. So here again, um, in AM radio during those years, uh, it was these songs were getting good radio play, but it had taken a while to be able to, oh, I can see a Turner. Oh, yes, I remember that song now. So it was a slow march until they recorded Proud Mary. And that was the catalyst that really ignited the spark. Yeah, it just, it, it blew up, didn't it? All over North America. <laughs> Absolutely. So now we're going to take a look at the mainstream successes covering the years of 1966 through to 1976. Impressed by the duo's performance on the big TNT show, Bill Spector, who was a, just a magnet in the decade of the 60s and 70s, he was eager to produce Turner working out a deal with the Ike and Tina Turner's manager, Rob Kresnow, who was also head of, uh, of Lorna. And Spectre offered, ready for this? He offered them $20,000 for creative control over the sessions to produce Ike and Tina Turner's songs. 20 grand. Like back in those days, like yeah, that's... That's cool. Oh, that's huge money. Huge money. So they signed to Phil Spector's Phillies label in April of 1966 after Turner had already recorded with him. Their first single on this label, River Deep Mountain High, 
which wow. was a good song, yeah. good, good song. And that was released in May of 1966. And Spectre considered that record with Turner's maximum energy over the wall of sound to be his best work, Phil Spectre's best work. Hmm. That's great. Yeah. And it was successful overseas too. It reached number three in the UK charts, number one on the um, Spanish charts. Now, the impact of the record gave Ike and Tina Turner an opening spot on the Rolling Stones UK tour. This would be, Dave, the fall of 1966. In November of 1967, Tina became the first female artist and the first black artist to appear on the cover of Rolling Stone magazine. Wow. Really? I yes. didn't know that. Either did I, Dave. Either That's did interesting. I. I have to look that up. That's cool. Yeah. The duo signed with uh, Blue Thumb Records in 1968, releasing the album Out of Season in 1969. The album produced their charted cover of Otis Redding's I've Been Loving You Too Long. Later that year, they released The Hunter. The title track, Albert King's The Hunter, earned Turner a Grammy nomination for Best Female R&B Vocal Performance. Now, the success of that album and uh, the headliner in Las Vegas, where they got their start through that, was a huge step, and they they were attended by very like just a numerous variety of, of celebrities who saw their shows, including you ready for this? This is like a who's who list back <laughs> in the late uh, 60s, early 70s. David Bowie, Sly Stone, Janis Joplin, Cher, James Brown, Ray Charles, Elton John and Elvis Presley. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. wow. And uh, what a tremendous headliner for Ike and Tina Turner. Um, for all of these well-known superstars of rock and roll. Unbelievable. That tells you they had some magic, right? That everybody else wanted to see them. You know what I mean? In that era? Absolutely. They were, they were that big. That's pretty cool. Um, yeah. Excellent. In the fall of 1969, Ike and Tina Turner's profile in their home country was raised after opening for the Rolling Stones on their U.S. tour. They gained more exposure from performances on the Ed Sullivan Show, which in that day, if you were on the Ed Sullivan Show, you had it made. Yeah. And uh, also the Andy Williams Show. They appeared on some of the Andy Williams shows, too. Now, the duo released two albums in 1970, Come Together and Working Together. Their cover of I Want to Take You Higher peaked at number 34 on the Billboard Top 100, whereas the original by Sly and the Family Stone had peaked at number 38. That's interesting, too. Very, very interesting. In early 1971, their cover of Credence Clearwater Revival's Proud Mary became their biggest hit. And did they ever do that up? Now, all due respect to Credence Clearwater Revival, Proud Mary, done by that band, was a tremendously huge hit also. I love both versions. How about yourself, Dave? I couldn't agree more. I, I, I love hearing Credence because obviously they wrote it and it's a pretty cool song. But then when you give it to someone like Tina Turner to sing, it's yep. a whole other level. It's just different, right? It's different. I shouldn't yep. say another level. It's mm -hmm. it, it makes it more rounded. It gives it more velocity, I guess. I don't know, but it, it just kind of, they're two totally different versions, but unbelievable in both. But yeah, hearing Tina Turner do it, it must have, that, that opened your eyes, right? He's just like, whoa, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And the um, Proud Mary single reached number four on the top 100 and sold more than a million copies. Wow. And of course, winning them a Grammy for the best R&B performance by a duo or group. And good for Tina and Ike. And 
they did an amazing job on Proud Mary. Yeah. In July of 1971, their live album, What You Hear Is What You Get, <laughs> was released. <laughs> it was recorded at uh, Carnegie Hall and became their first certified gold album. Later that year, they had a top 40 R&B hit called Oh Poo Poo Pa Do. Boy, that's interesting. Say that 10 times fast. <laughs> um, but here again, with being established as a Grammy Award winner for the best R&B performance, uh, they were well on their way. In 1973, their hit single, Nutbush City Limits, uh, was penned by Turner. It reached number one in Austria, number four in the UK, and in the top five charts of many countries. It was certified silver by the BPI for selling a quarter of a million copies alone in the UK. As a result of their success, they received the Golden European Record Award, the first ever given for selling more than one million records of Nutbush City Limits in Europe. How good is that? I didn't know that. Yeah, that's pretty wow. cool. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. And of course, um, here again, uh, Tina Turner got her start singing gospel music in the church. And this was a good foundation for her as she developed her music career. Now, we take a look at her solo career, the years 1976 to 1982. And Turner earned income by appearing on TV shows in those years, such as The Hollywood Squares, Donnie and Marie Osmond, The Sonny and Cher Show, and The Brady Bunch. All right, that's great. So here she has extra income coming in, not only through her music, but also um, earning her appearances on these very popular TV shows at the time. She resumed touring to pay off her debts with um, money given to her through United Artists. And uh, United Artists, they were a huge record company also during the uh, decade of the, especially the 70s. So in 1978, Tina released her third solo album called Rough on United Artists with distribution in North America and Europe through EMI. That was the big British uh, yep. record company. And uh, the album, along with the 1979 follow-up Love Explosion, which included a brief diversion to disco music, failed to chart. So United Artists Records and Turner, uh, unfortunately, they, they parted ways. In 1979, Australian manager Roger Davies agreed to manage Tina Turner after seeing her perform at the Fairmont Hotel in San Francisco. In early 1979, Tina worked in Italy as a regular performer on RET 1 TV series Lana Park, and it was hosted by Heather Paris. Later that year, she embarked on controversial five-week tour of South Africa during the apartheid uh, regime, and she later regretted that decision. However, here again, on a positive note, uh, granting her more experience in uh, different countries. We now take a look at Tina's resurgence and superstardom, the years 1983 to 2000. Turner was considered really considered a nostalgia act, performing mostly at hotel ballrooms and clubs in the United States. During her second stint at the Ritz, Carlton, she signed with Capitol Records in 1983. And of course, we both know, Dave, how big Capitol Records were uh, during those years. In November of 1983, she released her cover of Al Green's Let's Stay Together, which was produced, researched, and it hit several of the European charts. 
It was number six in the UK. In the the song peaked at number 2026 20, in Billboard Hot 100. I thought it would have gone higher than that. It's a really good song. Let's stay together. And it was uh, a number one hot dance club song for years. Now, following the uh, success of that, Capitol Records approved a studio album. Turner had two weeks to record her private dancer album, which was released in May of 1984. She only had two weeks to <laughs> release an oh. album. Like, wow. Talk about life in the fast lane. Wow. <laughs> so it reached number three on the Billboard Top 200 and uh, number two in the United Kingdom charts. So here she's, she's making her way. In May of 1984, Capitol issued the album's second single, What's Love Got to Do With It? And that was a huge, huge single recording for her. The song was previously um, been recorded by the pop group uh, Bucks Fizz. Bucks Fizz, I never heard of that pop Me group. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> What's Love Got to Do With It? Zoomed right to the top of the charts. So <clears throat> here we have Tina with her major comeback and resurgence. And a good part of that was the song, What's Love Got to Do With It? It just it just shot up out of nowhere, didn't it? It really did revitalize her whole career. Just everybody knew that song. You know, it took a few days and it, it must have just exploded because everybody liked it, loved it, and wanted to hear it again. Oh, absolutely, Dave. <laughs> it was as big, I think, as her resurgence song as uh, when Ike and Tina Turner did Proud Mary oh, back yeah, in sure. the earlier years. So here we are now in 1986. Tina released her sixth solo album entitled Break Every Rule, which reached number one in four countries and sold over five million copies worldwide within its first year of release. How good is that? The album sold more than a million copies in the United States and Germany alone. The album featured the single Typical Mail, Two People, What You Get Is What You See, and of course, um, the Grammy Award winning Back Where You Started. So here we have Tina coming back full resurgence and doing very well. And also that year, Dave, in 1986, uh, Tina, she received a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Good for her and well-deserved, too, Darren Tootin. Her Break Every, uh, Break Every Rule World Tour began in March of 1987 in Munich, Germany, was the third highest grossing tour by a female artist in North America that year. Wow. Amazing, unbelievable. In 1990, Tina embarked on her Foreign Affair European tour, which drew in nearly 4 million spectators. 4 million. I can't even comprehend 4 million people. And of course, it broke the record for a European tour that was previously set by Mick Jagger and the Rolling Stones. There you go. How good is that? In October of 1991, Tina released her first greatest hits compilation called Simply the Best, <laughs> which sold 7 million copies worldwide. Unbelievable. And I have a copy of that in CD. Here we are. There's Tina Turner. Yeah. And hold yeah. that up. Simply the Best. And uh, lot, just this is really the essential Tina Turner that you need to purchase. If it, folks, if you haven't got Tina Turner songs already, you can get it on the single CD through Capitol Records. It's called Tina Turner, Simply the Best. And if you have great. it on Amazon too or Spotify, you can download a lot of her great music over the years and uh, have that in your portfolio, portfolio yeah. as well. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So now we take a look at uh, Tina's later career, 2001, right up to 2021. In November of 2004, Tina released 
All the Best, which we just discussed, which debuted at number two on the Billboard Top 200 in 2005, her highest chart charting album in the United States. The album went platinum in the U.S. three months after its release and reached platinum status in seven other countries, including the U.K. In December of 2005, Turner was recognized by the Kennedy Center Honors at the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts in Washington, D.C., and was elected to join an elite group of entertainers. In February of 2006, Tina released Teach Me Again. Uh, this was a duet single with Italian singer, songwriter Elisa that was recorded for the anthology film All the Invisible Children. Now, the whole revenue from the single's sales were donated to charity projects for children led by the World Food Program and UNICEF. What a great, that, awesome. so kind, so yeah. very, very kind. Tina made a public comeback in February of 2008 at the Grammy Awards, where she performed alongside Beyonce. <laughs> hey, there's there is a match. In addition, she won a Grammy as a featured artist on River, the Joni Letters. In October of 2008, Turner embarked on her first tour in nearly 10 years with Tina's 50th anniversary tour. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And, and in support of the tour, Turner released a greatest hits compilation. The tour was a tremendously huge success and became one of the best selling tours of all time. Wow. Still that is, magic. Still oh, magic. my goodness. Just incredible. Incredible. In December 2016, Tina announced that she had been working on the film Tina, which was a musical based on her life story in collaboration with uh, uh, Fidia Lloyd and Stage Entertainment. Now, Turner received in 2018 the Grammy Lifetime Achievement Award, and her second memoir, My Love Story, was released in October of 2018. In 2020, just three short years ago, she came out of retirement to collaborate with Norwegian producer uh, Kigro on a remix of What's Love Got to Do With It? That was a remix. <clears throat> Excuse me. And with this release, she became the first artist to have a top 40 hit in seven consecutive decades <laughs> in the UK. And nobody will top that record, not even close. In 2020, Tina released her third book entitled Happiness Becomes You, a guide to changing your life for good. She co-wrote the book with American author Terrell Gold and Swiss singer Rugula Kuruti. It was chosen by Amazon's editors as a best nonfiction book of 2020. And in 2021, Tina appeared in the documentary film Tina, and that was directed by Dan Lindsay and TJ Martin. So here we have a mega superstar. And uh, with uh, Tina, as we had mentioned earlier in the broadcast there, Dave, she was always referred to as the queen of rock and roll. Tina is considered one of the greatest singers of all time. She was noted for her, I mentioned earlier, her swagger, her sensuality, the gravelly vocals, and also the longevity of her career. Journalist Kurt Loder uh, had mentioned that her voice combined the emotional force of the great blues singers with the sheer wallpaper overtone that was absolutely a unique 
performance, not only for her records, but also for her performances on stage. Very unique performance. So, wow, this is unbelievable. And uh, lastly, we take a look at Lisa, sorry, Tina Turner, the awards, the honors, and her achievements. Well, Tina previously held a Guinness World Record for the largest paying audience for a solo performer. And that was back in 1988, 180,000 people. I can't even imagine 180,000 people. What? <clears throat> wow. In the UK, Tina was the first artist to have a top 40 hit in seven consecutive decades. She has a total of 35 UK top 40 hits. She sold over 100 million records worldwide. Whoa. <laughs> and as of May of this year, Dave, May of 2023, Tina Turner reportedly sold around 100 to 150 million records worldwide. And that's May of this year, May 2023. That's incredible. <laughs> Unbelievable. Unbelievable. She, uh, you know, I, I respect the woman because she never gave up and she fought back. And, you know, to have such a, a golden career a little later in life is so, must have been so rewarding because she put in her time, paid the dues. We all know that. And it was just, it was, she was a joy to watch on stage. She was just so much energy and fun, like you said. That, that memory will always stick with me. Yep. Absolutely, Dave. And same here. Uh, Tina won a total of 12 Grammy Awards. These awards included the eight competitive Grammy Awards. She shares the record with Pat Benatar and with Cheryl Crow. For most awards, that's four, given for the best female rock vocal performance. Three of her recordings, River Deep, Mountain High, Proud Mary, and what's love got to do with it are in the Grammy Hall of Fame, and rightly so. Yep. Turner is the only female artist to have won a Grammy in the pop, rock, and R&B fields. Turner received a Grammy Lifetime Achievement Award in April of 2018. How good is that? It's incredible. The life of Tina Turner, mega superstar from the cotton fields of Nutfield, Tennessee, to the best of the best in music and pop rock. There we have it, Dave. What a, what a life and what a story. What what will you remember most, Randy? What will What's always your first thoughts of Tina Turner when you hear the name? Um, with Tina, I think the first, the early years of Tina Turner, um, I hadn't really kind of flewed into her music. It was kind of slow and generating, but once uh, Ike and Tina Turner hit the music scene with Proud Mary, then she became a focal point in my listening. I said, okay, so it's a duet, but Tina Turner's voice really, um, and I had to say the word, it overpowered, not really overpowered Ike's voice, but she was definitely a serious contender for female artist of the year. And I I knew this would come. It was just a matter of time. And whatever songs she wanted to perform and write, put with it, she was well on her way. This was a superstar in the making. And uh, But once they recorded Proud Mary, I was watching intently her career as she went along. Now, as a DJ, <clears throat> Mm -hmm. You get so much, so many requests for different songs when you do an event, and especially, uh, you know, with that <laughs> Tina Turner portfolio, what what one do you get asked for a lot? Does it depend on the age group, or is it just is there one that just pops all the time? Um, absolutely right, Dave. It all depends on the age demographics. Uh, for um, people that are uh, seniors like myself. Um, 
I get a lot of requests from the uh, seniors groups. Could you please play Proud Mary? I can Tina Turner. And for the uh, younger folks, um, guaranteed Tina Turner, they want to hear the best, the <laughs> best. No question about simply, it. Yeah. <laughs> simply <Yep>. put. Eh? <laughs> and the, the lyrics of that song really define her entire music career. Um, if you give a listen to the lyrics, it's it's really well done, really well done. What's your favorite song from Tina Turner of all time, Dave? Have you got I a favorite song? I would, you know, when simply the best is always. I always love hearing that when it comes on the radio. It just always, I always get get into it, want to sing along. You know, it's one of those yeah. ones that just keeps you going. Um, right on. It's, it's my last question for you, and I just kind of a little mm -hmm. bit deeper, but I want your thoughts on this because coming up through that era as a black woman singing mm -hmm. her influence on young ladies in the 60s 70s and 80s 90s is tremendous i think we forget to recognize that don't you absolutely um she really embodied the the exactness uh the musical persona stage performance like she had it all and she was quite a leader for artists coming up into the music world and she did it so so well um just certainly tina turner was the best i think that's the perfect way to end this show just what you said there she's the best thanks for doing this today randy had a ball doing it i want to get together with you again soon and do another show i'm glad that we got this opportunity to pay tribute to tina turner absolutely dave good working with you again and you have yourself a good week and be safe on those roads